Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Aftermath. Um, yeah, Sunday evening. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm just actually just kind of looking at the results from last night. There were some uh, some good fights. Uh, some very, very slow fights, though, I will go back to. And I've seen a few conversations, actually, as well, about, you know, whether the fight's in the apex, whether it's maybe maybe time to, to, to move out of the apex and start getting some crowds in. Um I think what was most strange about it is that it's it's Super Bowl weekend, so I bet Vegas is bouncing. I bet the Apex was the quietest place in, in town. Um, but I, I do definitely think, I mentioned it last week on the stream, I definitely think it's affecting some of the fights. Like some of these fights were a lot slower and more, you know, kind of kind of sparring paced than, uh, th than they would be if they were in front of 15,000 people. You know, it, it's... You feed off that energy, whether you recognize you do or not, whether you can hear your corner team or not, whether, you know, whether you've got support or not, it, like that energy is in the room and, it, and it's got to feel different. And they, like that as they were moving into the main card, there were so many spaces in the back of the room. I'm thinking to myself, like you could hear both corners and it is, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm hoping that we, uh, I'm hoping that we, we can start to see some more more events in front of crowds, especially because you know it was so cool when the UFC was on the road all the time. You know, of course, there's a there's an expense to that, and a it, it was it was always a massive undertaking, of course, for the UFC to be on the road all the time. But I don't know. There's just something about taking the fights to people's hometowns for being able, you know, being able to go to an event live, and you know, like when's the UFC ever going to pass by pass through Nottingham again? It probably never will. But it did once, you know, and people remember that forever. It, it's a it's a weird thing. There are so many fighters that may may never get the opportunity to fight in front of their home crowd because the UFC may just never go into that region anymore. Um, so I I do certainly hope that that's changing. And to be honest, you know, like without wanting to distract you and derail you uh, from from UFC stuff, but like the. the the PFL event that we've got coming up in Paris, like the tickets just went, like it was amazing to see how how fast they they went to, as soon as we'd announced that we were going to be there, and of course Doombay main eventing. Um, people want live sports, and there's nothing like live fight sports. There there really isn't. So uh, you know, the the more crowds, the better for me. Um, regarding slow fights, so so. <laughs> I don't tend to stay up all the way through the night anymore to watch the fights live. I tend to watch the main card the next day. And I do best I do the best I can to avoid social media. So like if anyone sends me a message on a Sunday morning, don't expect to receive a, a reply until early afternoon when I've caught up with the main card. Um But the yeah, the undercard was kinda like there were some very strategic fights, like the Loma fight. I, I'm I'm always interested to watch Loma because She's undersized for the weight class. She's really a natural atom weight, you know, and she was fighting somewhere in Bruna, Brazil that is, you know, height and reach advantage, uh, a very promising fighter as well. But, you know, Loma using her Muay Thai experience to be able to kind of like hold people off and pick them off. And and whenever someone's been in a been in a in a ring for the majority of their career and then they move into the cage we see it a lot with one championship with when they do the when they do fights in the cage i'm always interested to see how muay thai footwork transitions because like muay thai footwork is a different thing you know boxing footwork is very much tailored and and crafted for a boxing ring muay thai footwork can be but not all the time there, there tends to be a lot of um a lot of battling on the ropes and in the corner and, and those kind of things so for me, the, the footwork in Muay Thai is more of a Western boxing kind of influence. And whenever you see a Muay Thai fighter cross over into mixed martial arts and they go in from a ring into a cage, whether it's a circular cage or an octagon or hexagon or whatever it is, um, because the space changes, I, I'm always interested to see if their footwork changes, if they adapt. And for me, Loma uses the space really well. She's very good at understanding when she's backed up against the fence and when she needs to do something or move. Um... So that that for me was quite a strategic fight, but you know, if that had been in front of a live audience in you know in Singapore, it would have been wild, you know. And I remember, I'm, I'm, I remember calling one of the fights. I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was Singapore, and it was it was a it was it was wild because the thing is, every time she was engaging, the the crowd were lifting, and every time the crowd were lifting, then you know she was being encouraged to 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 go again. Yeah, Singapore. There we go. Ah, it was a, it was, it was her, 
UFC debut against Alexandra Albu, where Albu was basically trying to undress her the whole way through the fight by holding on to her clothing so she so she couldn't get to, so she couldn't get away. Um I mean early on in her career, of course, you know, she's what, nine and three now on a three fight win streak. Always gonna be undersized for this weight class, but with the technical ability that she's got, she's uh she's always always an exciting one to watch. Um what else? You'll have to excuse me, I'm just a tiny bit run down, like like maybe shave 10% off my performance right now. I'm planning I'm I'm starting a three day fast after this after this podcast. I'm gonna do a uh, a couple of hours of eating, filling my face, and then I'm a, I'm I'm gonna I'm, I'm endeavoring to do three days. I don't do these very often. Twenty four hours is quite quite easy, quite comfortable, but and the last time I did a three day fast was Fight Island, so I'm I'm about I'm about to do it. It's a good hard reset, is how I feel. So I'm gonna do that. Um, okay. So that basically excuse my if I'm snuffling or coughing, because I might do a little bit. I'll try and do it away from the mic, you know, to save your ears. Um Okay. What shall I talk about now? So there were a couple of fights that I found quite frustrating on this card. I, I found I found the Max Griffin Jeremiah Wells fight quite frustrating to watch. It was a split decision. I felt like both of them occasionally took a bit of a risk, but all but most of their risks were quite quite miscalculated. Like it was like they were like wild, messy, scrap scrappy exchanges. And I and I, I don't know. I don't know whether I don't know what the thinking was behind some of their their, their weapon uh, uh, their weapon selection. Um but for me that that was a really odd fight and then we went into the next one again with, with Pratniao, Devon Clark as well. And for as you know, for as as good of an athlete and strong as a wrestler as Devon Clark is and potentially could be, I always get the impression he just doesn't want to be there. He just doesn't enjoy it. And 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 for me that really shows. Like Pratniao is is an awkward individual. He's got that really kind of unusual bouncing in and out rhythm. And um because they referenced it on the commentary, actually, they mentioned that he's got a, a, a Kukushin Karate, which is, of course, you know, as you all know from Kukushin Karate, that's why he's bouncing in and out. Um, he looks awkward moving in and out, I think, because he's not used to doing it with Kukushin Karate. Like, any, like if you watch Kukushin, they tend to stand quite, quite rigid in front of one another and trade until, you know, either you, the, the, the round ends you've been outpointed or someone goes down. It's quite a hard style, quite a, a vicious style of, of karate, really. So when you see Pratniao moving in and out, he looks a little bit like it doesn't really suit him. And to be honest, although obviously it is a light heavyweight division and you can't be too confident moving forward and walking people down, I think I would like to see him adopt a little bit more of an Alex Pereira kind of style. Because... The thing with Pereira is he's able to walk people down because they're terrified that he's going to do something. And I feel like Pratniao could have that presence if he wasn't so er erratic. There were moments in that fight against Devin Clark where I feel like he really could have just kind of, you know, like put a stamp on it and encourage Devin Clark to to, to find himself out of there some way. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was an odd one. Like the light heavyweight division is in a bit of a bit of a, a weird situation at the moment, and I feel like. Yeah, I don't know where the next contender is going to come from, you could say. Um, okay, what else am I talking about? So I kind of switch over to the main card now. I'm going to chat about a couple of bits on the main card. First of all, um, Michael Johnson. Like, how often do you see someone announced in the UFC with a record of 23 and 19? It just goes to show you that records make no real difference whatsoever. For me, I'm not really bothered. I'm most interested in a fighter's last three, last three fights. Because that's really where they've got the the accumulation of all the experience up to that point in their career, and they're most likely going to be, you know, the best version of themselves, or at least hopefully, if they're at the right stage in their career. For Michael Johnson, and and there was great coaching in between rounds as well. Um, I think it was Henry Hoof that said it. He said, "We've lost fights because of no focus in the last round." For me, Michael Johnson could, could potentially beat anybody. I mean, you could argue he was probably closest to beating Khabib with the shot that he landed. Um, of course, he went on to get an absolute pasting after that. But still, Michael Johnson, the way that he moves, the way that he breaks his opponents down, I think sometimes the, the reason why he's not achieved the heights that he potentially could have done in the, in his career is, is because he's like switched off a little bit. 
You know, like you look what he did to Nate Diaz in, in, in the early going of that fight before Nate started to find his way back into it. It can be very dangerous. And what I loved about his performance in uh, 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 the weekend was constantly jabbing to the body, working to the body. You know, something that we don't see nearly enough of. And, and we're seeing more of it now. You know, people are starting to really, you know, really see the value of the body shows. But this kind of reflects on what happened in the in the uh, the main event. Because I was I was kind of thinking... I was kind of thinking going into this because, of course, Jack Manson's had a lot of inconsistency recently, and because Pfeiffer's, you know, he's a strong wrestler and he's a power puncher, and and he doesn't he doesn't waste a lot of energy. I was expecting him to to be able to at some point be able to connect and 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 hurt Jack Manson. But what we saw in in that fight, first of all, is Jack Manson playing a very very smart game plan, real like veteran decision making all the way through it. But second of all, the style that Jack Hermanson fights with, it encourages his opponent to headhunt. Nate Diaz is the same as this, you know, with his with his ability to kind of drift away. And, you know, you watch his f first fight against Conor McGregor, a lot of the big shots that McGregor would normally have sunk onto someone's chin, he was rolling off his lead shoulder. You know, it's like my, my analogy of fighting Nate Diaz would be, it must be like, like hitting a floor standing punch bag. You know, like those inflatable things, you blast it as hard as you can, it just drifts away and comes back. Like anybody that 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 is difficult to hit clean in the head, but you're very, very close, always seems, well not always, most of the time seems to encourage people to really keep swinging and pitching for the head. And Joe Pfeiffer in the first round fell for that trap a little bit. Because the way that Jack Hermanson moves, like he jogs back and he brings his his, his hands high, we talked about it in the war room, it's quite, un quite unorthodox. But he's protecting his head and he's moving away and he's moving in a straight line and he's leaving his body open. But almost always people keep swinging for, for his head. And that's because they, they keep coming close. Like they feel like the next punch is going to land. It's going to knock him out. And you could see that in Joe Pfeiffer in that first round. It was like, I kind of went down, I kind of wrote down like like a, a couple of words game plan for, for Hermanson in, in, uh, in each round. So for the first round, I, I put defensive and drift away. Like, he really did very little in the first round to engage. He allowed Joe Pfeiffer to kind of punch and, and, and throw, and he defended and slipped away and, you know, occasionally studied ground, his ground to try and throw, but didn't really invest in in winning the round, you could say. It was a, it were a, a smart way of just letting Joe Pfeiffer kind of burn off that first bit of energy that's going to make him the most dangerous, the most powerful. Then the second round, he started to, he was doing exactly the same thing. He was drifting away. And Joe Pfeiffer was able to return to the body a little bit before he started, to, before he got caught in the same trap where he was headhunting. But this is where, for me, Hermanson landed maybe three or four solid calf kicks that started to change the way that Joe Pfeiffer moved. You could see now he was struggling to move forward with his shots because he was, he was quite labored on his lead leg. And, and I will, I'm one little tangent for you. I will say, for as, as rough as a fight as Brad Tavares had, he did a very good job to hide how damaged his leg was. And he did a very good job in the first round to hide how hurt he was to the body. Go back and watch that first round. He was really hurt to the body in that first round and just game-faced it out. It was... Uh, I'll come back to Brad Tavares. I've got a couple of notes on him. I've kind of jumped straight to the main event. Um, so... Because Hamanson has that style, and and same with Strickland, same with um with Duplessis to a point. There, there's quite a few fighters that fall into this bracket where you can you almost catch them, you're almost getting them, so you feel more encouraged that the next punch is going to land, and you tend to find that a lot of energy is wasted by almost landing on fighters that have got got a uh, you know unorthodox defense, you could say. Because you feel like you're going to land. I mean, it's, you know, I, I I get it. I've been in that situation before where I'm like, okay, this, he can't keep slipping just out of the way all, all this time. And you start neglecting the rest of the body. Something something else that we discussed in the war room, um, it was, was Joe Pye for attacking the lead leg of Hermanson, taking some of that movement away from him. And and he did. He, he, he invested early in the leg. But because Hermanson was starting to pick his leg up and there was nothing there left to kick, it, he started to get discouraged. And I think that further pushed him in the direction of, of headhunting. Um, so I got first round defensive and drift away. 
I got second round, punish the lead leg and defend. Again, you know, smart decision making. He would push forward if if Pfeiffer was on the back foot, but if Pfeiffer started to come forward and he was starting to be enthusiastic, then Hermanson would give him that little bit of space. He would chop into that lead leg as he stepped forward and he would move away. And then the third round, this is where it was like, okay, I've drained most of the energy out of you now. Now I'm going to try and get that last little bit of a fight that you've got in you. And, and he did such a good job of just of stinging him on the nose and staying in his face and staying on his nerves. Like even when Pfeiffer was backed up against the fence and he was kind of waiting for Hermanson to go, all that time he's he's in a heightened state of awareness, which means his heart rate's up, which means his breathing's not steady. And he's waiting for Hermanson to do something, which might end up just being a calf kick and then Hermanson's gone again. So the calculation of Hermanson to slowly work his way into the fight working out of a good defense in the first round, starting to take away the lead leg of Pfeiffer in the second, then starting to work nice stinging jabs to the nose, bust his nose, punishing him on the way in and punishing him on the way out as well. Because there were lots of times where Hermanson broke the clinch either with a knee to a right hand or, you know, a couple of different uh, varieties of breaking the clinch. But again, applying his skills in the right time, not in a hurry to, to get the fight finished, knowing that he's got 25 minutes and he's just going to drag out this 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 beating, um, you know, to make it more effective and more one-sided. And and the thing is as well, like, like you, you know, you get to the end of the fight and you go scorecards, 48-47, Jack Hermanson. For me, that makes it sound like it was a closer fight than it was. I, I actually felt like there were, there were a few moments. So, this is sometimes a fun little game you can play. Put yourself for a moment in the corner of Joe Pfeiffer and, and watch the fight back. How many times do you think you were almost on your feet because you almost thought he was going to land that knockout shot? I would say somewhere between three and five moments in the whole fight. There was a, there was a time where Hermanson was backed up against the fence and Pfeiffer had landed a couple of really clean shots and you're like, this is the moment, this is the bit where he gets him. And, and, and it didn't play out that way. That's where the wisdom of Jack Hermanson plays in. Like, you've always got to kind of ask yourself, right, well, is, is the experience of a fighter going to offset the danger of the other? If you've got a young, dangerous fighter coming in, a prospect like Jack, uh, like Joe Pfeiffer, the moments in the fight where he can potentially take it away from Jack Hermanson, do they outweigh the experience that Jack Hermanson's got to stay safe in those moments? And we've seen uh, Jack Hermanson in some rough moments. We've seen him lose against power punches before. We've seen him, you know, <coughs> in very tight submissions, etc. All of that wisdom played into him building into the fight so he wasn't ever really fully extended. And it was a very clever game plan all the way through. As he got to the fourth round, that's when he started to really impose his game. That's when Pfeiffer's nose was bust. That's when his lead leg was really kind of shot. And then the last round, and I know we did we did get a, a kind of a well, actually there was I lost a minute of the fight. The start of the second round just disappeared on TNT Sport for whatever reason. Um, but he did have a takedown attempt at the start of that that round, if I remember correctly. We didn't see any grappling or wrestling from Hermanson until the halfway through the fifth round when he when he, he landed that beautiful takedown. And that really just kind of sealed the deal. It was it was enough to he'd beaten Joe Pfeiffer up enough to not really get too much resistance once he'd landed. Pfeiffer was already beaten, like he was already struggling to breathe through his nose and his leg wasn't responding to him. And and <coughs> Hamanson is, you know, he's a marathon runner when it comes to these rounds. You can imagine he could spar 10 rounds, no bother in the gym and, you know, be, be cruising. Um, really, really strong performance from Jack Hamanson. And I think that's the first time he's had, uh, where are we? Yeah, so he's, so he's, that, so he's turned it around now. He's back on, back on a winning track. It's been, so the last time he was on a win streak was, was 2019. It's a you know it's it's a a tough division that he's been alternating wins and losses. So that win streak he had from Telus Latus turning that fight around to Mershart, uh, David Branch, and Jacare, and then he's been alternating wins and losses. Lost to Cannoneer, win to Gastelum, lost to Vittori, win Shabazian, loss against Strickland, win against Curtis, loss against Delidze, win against Pfeiffer. Does the pattern continue? Does he get another absolute? 
killer in his next fight, potentially. But what we do know is we can't count Jack Hermanson out because he's got that 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 uh, that veteran experience, you know. And and I think it showed on the night. It was it was really impressive from him. And the other person for me, the performance of the night by far and a long way was Dan Ige. I, I'm, Jamie's sitting behind the camera he's not even we've not watched this fight yet he's, he's missed an absolute treat I've watched this maybe five or six times today he played a very very clever game against a fighter that can be very unorthodox and quite dangerous had a height and reach advantage in Andre Feely of course and someone that once he gets loose and kind of starts to flow you, you, you can't count him out given the fact that he is willing to try stuff now, Dan Ige's got quite a quite a, a simple, straightforward game for me. He doesn't really overextend himself too much. He's very good at testing the water before he jumps in. Like What we see in the Andre Feely fight, which was, what was it, about three minutes or something? Where are we? Two minutes, 43. So what, what you'll see in this fight is a couple of times, Dan Ige will move into range very quickly. And it's almost like because he kind of, because he, he, panics his opponent he kind of sees what they're going to do like he moves into range behind a tight guard and what he's seeing is Andre Feely getting tall and jogging backwards switching his stance swinging at the level where Dan Ige's head is the times when when he ran into range Andre Feely looked to me like he like he kind of lost his composure a little bit like he was a bit too excited but so so what what Dan Ige did was he kind of he kind of rebuilt the confidence of Andre Feely in that fight to start to open up a bit more because it started out where Feely was kind of waiting on Ige a little bit. I think he felt like Ige might have a speed advantage and he didn't want to get clipped with something. So it were, it took a while for Ige to kind of work the, the fight out of uh, Andre Feely. And that last the last piece of, uh, of, of the fight, the last, I don't know, what, 30 seconds or so, um, watch the space between them. Like Veronica and I were talking about this today, and 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 for me, it was this. It's a simple visualization. I like in, like picture a piece of bubble gum stuck between the two fighters. I know it's kind of a weird thing to say, but or a piece of elastic or whatever you like. What was happening was Danny Gay was moving away, and Andre Feely was being pulled into the space, and Danny Gay would move away, and Andre Feely would be pulled into the space a little further, and then Danny Gay would engage him with a jab and then move away, and Andre Feely would throw a jab. And Dan Ige would be just out of range. So it was almost like he was he was encouraging Andre Feely to just reach a little bit further, reach a little bit further, and jog back, and jog back. And Feely then reaches in, feeling confident that Ige is not going to be there to receive the jab. Bam. Lazy jab, just thrown out into space. Because Dan Ige had drawn him into that space, put him on the end of that right hand. And And the other thing I love as well about this finish... <coughs> I love the moment where a fighter sees their opponent go down, bam, and they take that one second just to walk over and give him one more clean shot. <laughs> it looks like a like a mob assassination, like bang, and then you walk over and one more in the head just to make sure they're done. It was a cold finish. That like Dan Ige came out of that looking like a gangster. It was a beautiful performance from Dan Ige. Um, just you know, just a just a, a, a statement in my opinion of uh of, of performances um okay the one other thing i want i had on my list to talk about was brad tavares now brad tavares was one of my training partners uh back in vegas in the day we used to train at drysdale's together and you know like it, he was he was always a, a a tough talented athletic individual was always pretty much in fight shape um, always had a skill set no matter where the fight went that could be problematic like good basics good striking skills good scrambling ability you know and, and and a lot of experience as well the one thing i feel like has always kind of held him back so what's his record now so 20 wins and nine losses the one thing i've always felt has held brad tavares back is that he's a little bit caught between weight classes so I'm just looking at his stats here on uh, on Wikipedia, which is notorious for not being accurate. Let me tell you today, we've had quite a we've had quite a day of Wikipedia editing. I'll bring you up to speed right now because you won't have watched the War Room yet because it's not been edited. So earlier today, I was researching um, 
uh, Ilya Toporia and Volkanovsky. And I was going through Toporia's record in chronological order, as I like to do. So I've got his Wikipedia page pulled up and I'm hitting the fights one at a time and get to the end of his career, finishes jo beats Josh Emma up, ready to move on to Volkanovsky. And I refresh the page and it said that Ilya Toporia was fighting Max Holloway for the interim title. And of course, like I spent most of the day thinking about Ilya Toporia with Volkanovski in front of him and Max Holloway is a very different fight. So I quick took a screenshot of it, posted on my Twitter. I've just checked Wikipedia page 10 minutes ago, et cetera, et cetera. And within, before I'd even sent the tweet, I'd refreshed it and it was back to Volkanovski. Anyway, since I had posted that, there's been a whole plethora of edits on the... Uh, the Wikipedia page of 298. And at one point, John Cena was fighting in the main event. Um, so, yeah, I don't, know, I don't know what's going on here. So anyway, a bit of a tangent. So basically, I know Wikipedia can't be entirely trusted, but it, it's, it's not, you know, it's not too bad. So look, the reason why I'm saying that, Brad Tavares is listed as being 5'11", with a 74-inch reach. That's that's pretty much my height and reach. He is built like a tank. There's no doubt about it. He's got thick, heavy, heavy legs. Definitely like carries more muscle mass than me. But height and reach wise, 5'11", 74 inches. That's 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 welterweight stats. Um, and, and of course, you know, like we, we're not determining whether someone's in the right weight class purely based on that. There are lots of other factors involved. But one of the reasons why I feel like Brad Tavares has maybe never quite reached his potential in this division is because he's a little bit caught between two divisions. And you can say that about a few different fighters. Like you can potentially say that about Chimaev. You know, you could say that about Kelvin Gastelum, although I don't I don't necessarily know that applies to Gastelum. Although if there was a weight class in between welterweight and middleweight, Gastelum would probably, you know, have a better fit there. And I think Brad Tavares would as well. And most likely, you know, the likes of Sean Strickland, who... Um, as ne you know, was never going to be the biggest uh, middleweight moving up from welterweight. Um, as I've been matching for this Paris card, um, and you know, we're 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 putting the the event on um, alongside the French Commission, and they have certain matching rules for certain weight classes, and it's it's the deeper weight classes uh, where where there are more restrictions for the the matching. You can't match certain fighters with so so little experience against like you couldn't have someone that's 5 and 0 against someone that's you know 20 and 10 for example even though you know that that does happen on, a, on in a lot of other places um but what's interesting is that they restrict those matchmaking um rules to the weight classes that can that can sustain it which are lightweight welterweight middleweight and, I, and I, I'm just going to throw this out there because I know that this circles around over and over again and there's a discussion about, well, you know, we could do with more weight classes, et cetera, et cetera. Like, the, the majority of the population, the male population of mixed martial arts falls within lightweight to middleweight, particularly lightweight and welterweight. There are some people that end up in middleweight because they're just a little bit too big for welterweight. Now, what's worth bearing in mind is that 155 to 170 is a 15 pound jump so that's a big chunk of weight then you've got 170 to 185 that's also a big jump so if you're walking around and you're struggling you like you, your ideal weight is probably 175 you, you're gonna you're gonna either have to really force yourself to get down to welterweight or just move up a weight class and i do think at some point mma could withstand a couple more weight classes and of course i'm biased because I was a welterweight potentially that's that's gonna you know inform my bias but i would leave welterweight where it is i would do a 162 weight class and i would do a 177 weight class i would put two weight classes in the busiest bracket in mixed martial arts and what that will give us is more champions and more champions versus champions fights and more moving from one weight class to another because moving from 155 to 162 is not big of a jump the one pound allowance 162 163 is right in between the two weight classes and 177 like imagine brad tavares kelvin gastelum at 177 you know what i mean like there's there are a lot of fighters same thing with with lightweight to welterweight the likes of cowboy and uh uh masvidal etc people that were kind of they could drift between the two but that's strongest weight class 
I think uh, <clears throat> I think he's a good example of where that weight class could be could be beneficial because I feel like Brad Tavares, having trained with him and, and watching what he does against much bigger, stronger fighters, I feel like if he was within the right weight class, he would be uh, he would be more effective. Because I thought he looked good in that first round. I thought he was moving well. I thought he was he was defending very very consciously in that first round. But you know, I mean, just the the size of Rodriguez, the power that he has, uh, he he just made uh, Brad Tavares look undersized. I wonder. I wonder if he could make well to weight. I wonder if he could get there. I'm sure he's. Have a look down here. Yeah, he's not. I've not got a welterweight fight on his record, from what I can tell. Yeah. Okay. We got any questions, Jamie? I'm just rattling on here. We've gone. We've gone for like forty, what, forty minutes, and I've been chatting away. Yeah, we've. Uh, you can leave me in a room on my own. And I can just talk. <laughs> what are you can say, Jamie? Sorry. Yeah, uh, we've got a few questions. Um, first one from Brando. Uh, what? What's Marlon that? Brando. Uh, not, Probably I don't know if it's one. better. I know it's from that. Maybe he's a fan. <laughs> um, but what's next for Jack Comanson now? Is is he the gatekeeper, or do you think he's got one more run in him? Okay, let me have a quick. Let me just pull up the UFC rankings and see where they fall right now. It's just consistency, isn't it? Right, like he's just he's just turned it back around, got back in the win column. When people were starting to get excited about his potential, it was when he was on a, on that four fight win streak, um, you know, back in two thousand nineteen. And honestly, it seems like a long time ago now. But then, when you look at the times when Jack Hermanson's performed at his best, you know, the Edmund Shabazian fight surprised everybody. I think the Joe Pfeiffer fight has surprised a lot of people as well. Um, he he just needs he needs a he needs consistency and b he needs marquee wins. The four fight win streak, May two thousand eighteen to April two thousand nineteen, like he had a good what twelve months there of 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 competing and, and winning, and he picked up wins over veterans, well known fighters, as well as Jacare, who you know is has been held in very high regard, and that was a five round unanimous decision, and almost submitted him in the first round with that Joker team. Like at that point, everyone was like, okay, Jack Hermanson might be one of the guys in this division. But then since that, like I said, he, he's alternated wins and losses. And it's not like he's he's fighting, you know, middle of the road guys. Like he's losing to, to top 10 fighters. Um, but if he's going to get back to the top, he needs that that consistency. And he's going to need, first of all, consistency and second of all, marquee names. So where are we right now? These have not been updated yet, have they? Because it's Sunday night. But So Jack Hermanson will most likely... Or maybe he won't move up the rankings because uh, yeah, Pfeiffer wasn't ranked, was he? Okay, so we've got so above Hamanson. Hamanson's at number eleven currently. We've got Delidze, Chimaev, Imovov, Brendan Allen, um, Paolo Costa, Marvin Vittori, Jared Cannonier, Robert Whittaker, Israel Adesanya, Sean Strickland, and then the champion Drikus Duplessis. I wouldn't mind seeing Jack Amanson get the get the the person that comes out on the losing end of Whitaker Costa. That would make a lot of sense. They're in the same kind of uh, competition bracket when it comes to timing. Um, I haven't yet done the breakdown on that one. I'm going to record that tomorrow, so I'm going to get into my research for that after we've uh, we've done this live stream. But of course, Rob Whitaker is a is a phenomenal fighter, and Paolo Costa. You know, he might be a little bit basic, but he's enthusiastic and he's well conditioned. <laughs> I got so, I got so much shit for calling him a bodybuilder. Like I was uh, literally, I was expecting to get jumped at the hotel in Fight Island. One hundred percent. I'm not even joking. Um, like who knows? Like Paolo Costa could overwhelm Rob Whitaker just purely with ferocity and with and with size. And we, we that is a three round fight, isn't it, Jamie? We did, yeah. So like again, you know, he he doesn't really need to conserve energy a great deal compared to how he would if he was fighting Adesanya over five rounds or even Whitaker over five rounds. You know, it's a different energy management. But Manson's sitting around the top ten right now. I wouldn't mind seeing him pick up the the loser of that fight. That would make a lot of sense, especially because the other guys above him they're all. I mean, maybe not Delidze, we could do that as a rematch, but um, 
you've got a selection of people there that are kind of like Chemayev, Imovov, Brendan Allen. They're all kind of on the move north. So it, so it would make sense for someone ranked number 11 to pick up someone that's coming off a loss out of the top five. And that's really what you would have with Paolo Costa at six and Whitaker at number three. Um, that's probably what I would do. But what do I know? I'm, I'm not a matchmaker. Oh, I am a matchmaker now. That's it. Honestly, it's, I would imagine it's so much more fun to matchmake for the UFC because you've got 800 athletes and you've got, you know, it, it's it like everybody wants to get on the UFC roster. You've got people jumping at the opportunity, going up weight classes. And I will give what you call it a shout out. And I mean, no offense by calling you what you call it, but you will appreciate I've been punched in the head a lot. Um, what was his name? Timothy. He fought Oki. Um, Belgium's on the rise. I will say that. I will say that. That was that was a tough fight though. But but Timothy, you know, gave a hell of a performance in that one. Considering he moved up to lightweight, he fought last weekend on Tough Enough. Um, I've been to, to a few of those shows. They're really good shows. Um, but then yeah, a week later he's fighting at the Apex in the UFC. To be honest, the crowd at Tough Enough was probably a lot bigger and a lot better and a lot more rowdy than it was at the Apex. But he gave a hell of a performance. Um, so yeah. Um, certainly someone to keep him, keep, uh, our eyes on when he goes back down to featherweight because he was, uh, he was a, he was a real scrapper. Um, okay. Any other questions, Jamie? People want to know what I'm drinking, don't they? Yeah. Well, right. so, yeah, question? a couple of people have asked, yeah. <coughs> well, <coughs> well, of course it's rum Sundays. So that goes without saying, but I needed a long drink today. So like, you know, a, a, a dash of rum would have just been a little bit too much. I'd be, I'd be coughing too much. So, um, I got a can of Vimto. What what flavor is Vimto? It's, it's like, like Dr a, Pepper, isn't it? It's like what what flavor yeah. is Dr Pepper? Like yeah, Vimto is like the English Dr Pepper, you could yeah, say, yeah. you know. But it, it it's it's pretty good. I'll be or honest, uh, so. dandelion and burdock. Oh that man, was... you can't you can't mess with dandelion and burdock. I know that that's gonna sound like it sounds really old fashioned, don't mm. it? Dandelion and burdock. It's like they're two leaves, but it was a it was a pop drink. A, a, a soda that uh, was very popular when I was younger. You can still get it now, but it's yeah. a bit more boutique now, isn't it? Yeah. A bit more hipster. Comes in glass bottles at expensive chip shops. Yeah, it's all like the bottom shelf for the fridge and yeah. BP garage or Yeah, something. I'm a bottom shelf kind of guy. <laughs> I love a, I love a Fentimans. <laughs> okay. um, apparently, I didn't, I didn't realise it's Super Bowl night tonight. It is the Super Bowl. Of course it is. Uh, so a lot of people are asking who you th who, who have you got? Well, I mean, you know, if 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 the conspiracy theories are right, then it's already predetermined. <laughs> um, I, I honestly don't know. I don't know. The thing is with American football, football for everybody in America, I can get really into it. I can get really into it, and when it comes time for like, especially when I was in training camp. I, most of my time now I'm, I spend watching fights. If, I, if I'm watching MMA, then I'm researching. And if I'm watching something other than MMA, boxing, that's usually for pleasure. Boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, etc. When I was in training camp, I, I would be very specific about what I watched. Now I watch a lot of stuff that I wouldn't have normally watched. Just because I'm getting through fighters' names and researching records and potentially signing people. So when I was in training camp, I had I had there were so so fewer fighters that I would like to watch that would give me the feeling that I wanted in training camp. So I used to watch um, a lot of American football stuff because it was easy to watch. They were the the the, the physicality of those guys in particular um, was was phenomenal. And you know I just kind of liked the idea of, and this is probably a you know this is a much much bigger longer podcast probably even a series but ultimately you know sport is warfare isn't it right so american football is a is a uh is battle lines you've got two battle lines you've got two armies you've got <coughs> the head of both the armies and and the goal um to, <coughs> to get to the king to get to the end zone to get to the leader of the army to take the take the head of the army's head off and american football has got many different components and 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 parts and um positions that's the word i was looking for 
And all of those different positions that make up a team in American football are all different assets that make up an individual in a mixed martial arts bout. You've got to be attack and defense. You've got to be the leader of the army as well as the soldiers. You know what I mean? So I always used to like to watch an American football team, a football team, function as a unit and how well rehearsed it was. And then, you know, the old hard knocks documentaries and those kind of things, when you get that insight into the grind of a of a of a training camp and, you know, the pressure that those guys are under. When it gets to the Super Bowl, and like I said, if if I get into it, I really get into it. Like they are dealing with the 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 greatest pressure that you, that they could be experiencing as as a as a football player. And they're relying on teammates to be as sharp and as determined, which is something that I was never very good at. I played rugby and football a li- little bit, but I wasn't very good on teams. Um, so that, like that, that for me would be another challenge. You know what I mean? To like to be in that kind of pressure situation and then hope everyone else is a dealing with the pressure and feeling as motivated as you are to win. And you know, fascinating, it really is. Uh, but I haven't honestly followed it this this year, um, which. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. When, when, the, when the Raiders get back in the Super Bowl, if that ever happens, then I'll follow that one because I, I don't have any particular reason why I like the Raiders apart from they're the bad guys of the league, it seems to me. And also because for some reason, and people that grew up in the 90s in the UK might also have experienced the same thing. I could always find Raiders games on weekends like at like 7 o'clock in the morning being played on one of the 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 channels on my TV in my bedroom, so I watched loads and loads of Raiders. So whenever I was given the option to watch shirt and hat and whatever else you want, it was always Raiders. So uh, that's my that's been my adopted team for a, for a long time now. And John Matuzak was on the Raiders as well, who was in Goonies, which is also one of my favourite movies. Hey you guys, there we go. <coughs> that was a random question. Super Bowl. Don't normally get questions about that. <clears throat> my goodness yeah it's always on super late isn't it here though isn't it yeah like it is yeah 11 <clears throat> starts at midnight here i think yeah the nottingham panthers used to all get together to watch it so i watched it with them a couple of, a couple of times around because obviously there's you know there's a, a, a mix of like americans on the team and so they always used to stay up to watch it yeah i could really get into it though you know what i mean i could be quite obsessive about it one of my favorite fight week movies was friday night lights like what? What a great movie! Can you be perfect? What a great movie that was! Um, yeah. Any more questions, Jamie? Yeah, we got a few more. Um, there was one. Sorry, just gonna scroll scroll that back. From Lazy Bed, oh, regular on the chat. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Johnson. Do you think he's the most coin flip fighter <laughs> ever in UFC history? He could well be. He could well be. And and this but this is the thing about that is like it like I don't think it needs to be a coin flip. Do you know what I mean? I I don't I don't think it needs to be a coin flip. I think it, I think sometimes it becomes a coin flip because he sometimes kind of like drifts off a little bit, sometimes loses focus. Um yeah, I I don't know what uh, I don't know what what would be the fix for Michael Johnson, but like, what's his record now? Twenty four and nineteen. Yeah, 20, after that's like twenty three and nineteen. Twenty three and nineteen. That's a wild record. That it's uh, you don't see it very often, but um, records are for DJs and all that. So, uh, the chicken brain. I've got the live stream pulled up now. Uh, I am a little bit sick. The chicken brain. Yes, just a little bit sick. I was actually talking about this at the um at the very start of the the live stream i'm i'm going i'm starting to fast after feasting this evening when i've done this yeah see if that can reset me sometimes it helps okay Oh yeah, Henry Cejudo's back this weekend. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. I just kind of, I, I kind of jump from one one event to the next, and now because I'm not specifically UFC focused, I, I tend to overlook some of the fights on the undercard. So Oban Elliott is fighting uh, on the prelims. It'll be the second fight of the night against Val Woodburn. Um, Oban Elliott's a lot of fun. 
very very fun to watch good hands fast the welsh gangster make sure you tune in and watch that um what else have we got amanda lemos mackenzie dern will be a good fight that will be an absolute scrap amanda lemos always always brings the heat and and of course yeah marab against uh Cejudo. we're gonna do a, a an outlaw picks podcast i would imagine that while veronica's in the live chat now she's also researching for the uh for the podcast tomorrow um yeah so we'll be doing that that'll be out what tuesday yeah. picks podcast but yeah that'll be out on tuesday war rooms tomorrow podcast tuesday oh jamie you've just reminded me uh so you've just started so jamie's just started a, um a poll for the ufc 298 main event i had one running on my i've had two polls going this week actually on my on my social media one of which i won't delve into too much but i will do soon 95 percent of people out of 7,000 votes prefer MMA with elbows. I I, I assume that probably 4% out of the five just slipped when they were making their choice. Because, I mean, who doesn't like elbows in MMA? It's a very strange, very strange concept to me to want to take those, take those out because they make for such exciting fights. And the other poll, which, which I only put on for two hours, um... So the final results, oh my goodness, we've got 77% of people, we had 1,200 votes in two hours, 77% of people think that Volk is going to beat Taporia. How about that? What's this poll saying? Yeah, this, but I think I think majority of people do think, yeah, Volkanovski is going to beat him. Yeah. Maybe it's the, I think the overconfidence of Taporia might have put them off him a little bit as well do you think, think that's what it is yeah you think maybe uh maybe people are like well yeah it makes sense it makes sense i don't like, know i don't know I, I just i kind of feel like because i kind of feel like because like like mcgregor was mystic mac wasn't he you know what i mean he was like project uh, he was like predicting what was going to happen and like people seem to really get on board with that so i think sometimes confidence can be quite addictive as well and, and uh, so, like, I would imagine that there are a lot of people that are that are looking at Tapori and going, like, he he believes one hundred percent he's going to be the champion. I kind of believe him too because you know what I mean. I, I don't know. I, I I wasn't expecting it. Yes, Pantera. Um, I wasn't expecting it to be. Uh, that stacked for Volk, if I'm honest. Seventy seven percent on. So what we got. It's been going two minutes. We've got 63, 64 votes. Oh, wagon, I have to vote, don't I, in order to be able to see the results. Well, I'm not I'm not sure. I'm not telling you which way I'm voting. So okay, so we've got 68 to 31 here for for Volk. It's a bit closer. I think it's gonna be uh obviously just dis despite uh Makachev. Def I think it might be just uh hardest test in the featherweight division mm. so far yeah 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 do, do you think here's what here's a question for the people in the comments do you think that that Ilya Taporia's neck attacks are as dangerous as Brian Ortega's because after watching that the escapes today from that mounted guillotine I like I don't know I'll tell you what else was odd as well, wasn't it? it was the uh, the um, the Rodolfo Vieira finish? Like Kylo Ren looked very confused after that fight. <laughs> you know what I mean? I can't I can't not see Kylo Ren when I see what's his what's his name? Uh, Adam Petrosian. Driver. Oh, sorry, yeah, <laughs> I thought you Petrosian. Meant the actor. Uh, yeah, Petrosian. Yeah, yeah. He like. Oh yeah, he does. Like I was trying. Yeah, he does. Yeah, <laughs> Kylo Ren in it. Like I, I I I was I was trying to figure out what was going on with that fight because it was like. Like he definitely tapped, but then as soon as the referee got involved and like you know like uh, uh, told Vieira to get up, he was like he was like up and he was fighting. And he looked real confused, and I watched it back a few times. And I'm like, did he? Was he like, was he like just tapping before he went unconscious, and or was it a phantom tap? And was he trying to? I don't know it was a weird thing, but um, Adolfo Vieira has got some pythons for arms i tell you what my arms were aching just looking at him in his post-fight interview he's he's <laughs> his bicep looked like a map of london you know, like all the veins and stuff all over it mad 
I, uh, yeah. Self-editing for our live stream there. There was a there was a conversation that went on in my head there, and I just I just snatched it back from the public. Sorry, guys, but you know, in this day and age, you have to you have to catch yourself. Um, but he's a very strong individual. Oh yeah, in fact, um, Omnipolar seven seven seven, Prime Drink Curse. I don't know honestly what you are referring to. But what I will say is there was a fighter last night in the cage and when he came back to his corner at the end of the first round, they went to give him prime. <laughs> and he was like, no, 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 just, just some water. And they didn't have water in the bucket. They just had a bottle of prime. So he ended up drinking prime between rounds. Which from what I know is not allowed. He shouldn't even have it in his bucket. That should have been checked. But oh, imagine that being dehydrated and then someone gives you that that sugar water, I can't talk, can I? I mean, look at this. But this Vimto, I mean, you know, this was invented in like the like the 1800s, so, you know. Um, yeah, they had no water. Yeah, Lazy Bed. Lazy Bed spotted it. Of course, Lazy Bed did. Yeah, I felt so bad for the guy. Like, like you, you just sometimes... And the thing is, the reality as well is you don't really need water between rounds. Like, you're not going to dehydrate in 15 minutes in, in the apex, let's be honest. Especially when there's only 12 people in there. Um, sometimes you just need to kind of rinse your mouth out. You know what I mean? You just need to like... It's like a bit of a refresh. It's like when fighters pour water on themselves. You just get that like little moment where you go, oh, that's cold. And then before you know it, they're toweling you off. But even just the little moment where you get that little shock from the water is enough. It's the same thing with the ice on the back, and like people have a few different, uh, a few different things that they like. But yeah, the water thing is a bit more of a psychological thing, and sometimes it can just refresh you by just getting a a, a rinse. Um, that's why, of course, in boxing, most of the time they'll spit it out. But in MMA, we like to chug in the corners. Two things you need to do in corners: you need to breathe, and you need to have three people in the corner that remind you to breathe because of all the things you're going to forget to do in an athletic endeavor. When you come back to your corner and you're sitting down, you've got 60 seconds. You need three different people to tell you to breathe. Come on now. Come on now. Two things I would get rid of. One, people in the corner that tell you to breathe and don't give you any other information. Like It, it became a thing at one point. Like, okay, slow your breathing down. You know, we had, we had uh, um, what's it, uh, um, Greg Jackson in the corner of... Uh, <laughs> In the corner of John Jones, and breathe, and you're in your waterfall, and find your center. You know what I mean? And it was like he had this kind of meditative thing. But then from that, it's like everyone goes, "Oh, okay, yeah, no, we've got to, That's that's what I do as a cornerman. I tell people to breathe." Um, and the other thing as well, hand the bottle to the fighter. Don't give them the water because the amount of times I see someone being waterboarded in the corner, they're being told to breathe while someone's spraying water in their mouth. Going, like hand them the water the reason why i've said this before you know you, you you know i'm sick of saying this the reason why people give the fighter water is because normally they've got big gloves so they can't hold the bottle but in mma we have our fingers free oh i never got all the gloves i was gonna do the little show and tell wasn't i i'll do it next time i'll do it next time i've rambled enough um yeah like hand the fighter the water like they can judge themselves it's very difficult to give somebody water like you know like i'm i'm constantly trying to trying to give veronica a drink between backgrounds when she's got lace-ups and we i always spill the water all over the place it's not an easy thing to do um yeah here's my here's my little my little sunday evening rant and look at that greg hardy moment who's greg hardy it's not me <laughs> greg hardy. oh yeah the he had the inhaler didn't he yeah, yeah. of course he did yes Marcano, 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 Marcano. Thank you for the donation. Yes, of course the the uh, the inhaler thing. That was yeah, that was that was very strange. Bunch of waterfall. Yeah, I've seen a quite a few people online say this as well. But uh, Bogdan Guskov. Yeah, the guy that like looks like Anthony Smith. Anthony Smith. <laughs> <laughs> it's mad, isn't it? It's crazy how much he looks like Anthony Smith. It's it's fun though because uh, did you see the photograph of them together today? Like sometimes yeah. you go, oh well, yeah, these these people really look alike, and then you see them together, and you're like, ah, oh, no, they they actually not that mm. alike. Like Mark Goddard and um, what's the what's the other referee? Kevin Mulholland, Mulholland, Mulhol, Mul? 
No. No. McDonald. No, there's Kevin the McDonald. There's, no, there's the small the smaller referee that looks like Goddard. Ah, oh, I can't remember his name now. They got the same haircut and everything. Is it McCleary and Kevin? No. I can't remember. Anyway. The reason why I'm mentioning that is because often, like, like Goddard is somewhere else in the world working and he's getting shit on his socials because that referee's doing something that that they want to. Yeah, give. it is Kevin McDonald. Kevin McDonald. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he ain't does. Right. So, like so you brother. see, the thing is, right? He looks so like he looks like Mark Goddard. Yeah. But when you actually put them together, they look nothing alike. They look nothing alike, right? However, what's his name? Armand Petrosian is Kylo Ren. You could put them next to one another, and I think they look alike. So you know, it's like actual look alike. I would say that uh, what's what was his name, Guskov? Yeah, he was a scary looking individual, and so is Anthony Smith. Okay. Yeah, la lazy bed. Um, lazy bed. What do you think's next for him, Bogdan Guskov? I don't know. I, I'm I'm not sure. I mean, we don't really know a great deal about him, do we? Up to, up to now. I mean. Uh, Let's have, a, let's have a quick look at his, at his actual typology because he has. There we are. Um. Okay, of course, yeah. So he's so he he lost his debut to Volcan. Gave a good account of himself though, from what I can remember up until that point. Um. Stop his loss on his record. I mean, so. When I click on someone's record, let me tell you what I, what I kind of look for. First of all, tapology is really good because it tells me the records of their opponents when they faced them. So, like, what I can see from uh, from this record of Guskov is before he got to the UFC, he was fighting guys with a variety of different records. Some of them, the likes of twenty and ten. Some of the likes of four and one. Do you know what I mean? So, like. As I look down someone's record and I, and I see that much inconsistency with their opponent's records, I, I it's difficult to build up a real picture of, of what that person is capable of. Something else that's that's useful as well, you know, if, if you're out there and you're researching fighters or you have your own analysis shows and whatever else, um, check their topology, check their opponent's record at the time they fought and then see what happened to their opponent after the fact. Like, say, for example, <clears throat> he's got a loss on his record here to a guy that's 33 and 8. Valis, I'm not going to say his name, 36 and 9. See, like, a lot of the time, some, a lot of the time you, you'll see whether someone's gone on a good trajectory after that, that fight or a bad trajectory, and then you can kind of gauge someone's level. But honestly, at this, at this, especially at this weight class, light heavyweight, you can run into people that are absolute world beaters and then people that have got good records that are not not that that great. <coughs> As we know, light heavyweight, light middleweight it is is a very inconsistent weight class for 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 a, a standard of the weight class. So, oh, Jamie's giggling. Go on, what what are you giggling at, Jamie? No, it's just uh, I think you mentioned the Jackson Wink thing, uh, yeah. John Jones. Lazy bit just put, um, was it the Jackson Wink fighters who did the nipple pinch before the fight? <laughs> yes, it was. It was uh, Rashad <laughs> Evans. Yeah. Yeah, it was that was a weird thing. That was a that was a that was a weird thing. Sometimes I think people just I think if I remember right, they were doing it to try and take like the pressure out of the situation, to do something weird that was kinda you know, that that was the thinking behind it. <clears throat> right, go on. I'll I'll, I'll take one why am I? Oh, we got another donation. Kearney, thank you, Matt Kearney. Fighters need to grow from boys to men, but also from girls to women. Meaning, developing emotional control. Fury and McGregor's name calling might not work on a more emotionally secure opponent. You know, it's a good point. But there, there are lots of different ways to 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 get under people's skin, or get a rise out of them, or get the reaction out of them that you want. Um, I mean, like for for example, so when, like when I fought Marcus Davis, I knew for sure that if I if I poked at him enough, that I would get a real rise out of him because he was a very kind of emotionally charged person, and he carried that on the surface. After that fight, I went to I went into a fight against Mike Swick, and Mike Swick was super laid back, very chilled. So I knew that if I invested loads of trash talk into that, it would have wouldn't have gone anywhere. 
Mike would have enjoyed it because he would have found it funny. So I didn't do any trash talking going into that fight. And that was a little bit unsettling because he was like waiting on where's the trash talk coming, you know what I mean? So you have to kind of choose your moments. You have to kind of like 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 do a, do a bit of a psychological assessment on your opponent and see if you can find those 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 weak spots. Um, of course, within region, re, within reason, I think people have been stepping out of line a little bit recently, perhaps. But you know, maybe that's not for me to decide. Right? Should we wrap it there, Jamie? Is that a good time to call it a day? That's about an hour. Thank you very much for joining me, as always. I hope you've uh, hope you've enjoyed your weekend and you're feeling all rested and ready for Monday. Um, I'm a little bit, a little bit. 10% under the weather, but I'll be back on track very soon. I appreciate you joining me as always. I hope you have a solid week. Um, I hope you're looking forward to UFC 298. We'll have main event, co-main event, war room, and a picks podcast this week. Um, so like and subscribe. Be nice to everybody. Be nice to yourselves. And I will see you very soon.